about what's going on under the under the under the covers here. Basically, there's two ways that you could attack um, you can attack this problem as an attacker that sees all that public that public data. The first way is you could try to go and um, recover either of their private keys. So you could look at um, Diffie's public key G to the A and the generator that you know and try to reco recover A. And if you do that, then obviously you can uh, recover the shared secret because you've got Hellman's public key as well. So that's one way you could go about trying to solve the, trying to break the scheme is to solve the uh, discrete logarithm problem. So given, given G and G to the X, find X. That's the discrete log problem. There's also another problem that we hope is, is hard. Um, and that is when you're given both of the public keys and uh, the generator, trying to come up with a shared secret. Um, now it's unknown whether uh, this second problem is as hard as the first one or not. Uh, but certainly the first one is uh, at least as hard as the second one. So if you can solve the first one, you can definitely solve the second one, but it's un unclear whether the converse is true. There might be a, an easier way to solve this um, that, that still you can't solve instances of this with an algorithm that can solve this problem. Okay, but the, really the, the, the fundamental, co the fundamental um, problem that you want to be thinking of is this discrete log problem. Given, given two elements in a group um, that are, are related by some secret exponent, find the exponent. Um, and so for us that are, that are doing cryptography, that are trying to protect our data and, and, and work in the constructive or the forward direction, um, the, fundal, the fundamental operation that we're, um, that we're working with here is, is group exponentiation. So basically every time um, Diffie and Hellman want to create a public key, or every, every time they want to um, compute a shared secret, they have to take some element in the group um, and raise it to some exponent, okay? And the way that we do that in the naive in the naive way, or at least in a multiplicative group, is we write the exponent in base 2, and we, we write its binary representation, um, and we square and multiply according to the bits of this, this binary sequence. So every time we see a, a 0 in the exponent x, we square, and every time we see a 1, we square and then we multiply by the original g, okay? Pretty straightforward, um, but that's the way you perform these exponential size computations in, in polynomial logarithmic time. Um, but that's the way you do these uh, big exponentiations efficiently. Okay, but, but uh, we're, we're here we're working mod modulo q, but note that we've only got one operation happening here. Um, we don't have to ever, to do Diffie-Hellman, we don't ever have to do additions in, the, in, um, in modulo q. We're only ever doing multiplications, which is why we say we're, we're working in the multiplicative group. Um, so the, the point here is that there's one operation that's going on, namely multiplication. We only need one operation. We only need a group. Um, so yeah, the, this is the fundamental operation that we're going to be talking about a lot today, which is group exponentiation. How do we do group exponentiation depending on the underlying group? Um, and again, I say that the main reason um, that finite fields have to be so big nowadays that those numbers out to be so huge is that um, attacks on these things have become a lot better since they were proposed. Index calculus is, is quite a powerful tool to attack the problem. It's, it, it runs in sub-exponential time, um, which is why these which is why these parameters have to be so large. And so, roughly ten years after um, Dickey and Hellman said we could do we could do public key cryptography this way using the discrete log problem. Um, uh, Koblitz and Miller independently observed that um, all we really need here is a group. All we need is a, is a, is a set, a finite set with one operation um, with a hard discrete log problem. And if we've, got, if we've got such a group with a hard discrete log problem, then we can do Diffie-Hellman based cryptography or discrete log based cryptography. Um, and so they both said, why not use elliptic curve groups? So there were these two papers in the 80s that said, okay, let's do public key cryptography using elliptic curves. Um, and the rationale, in fact, quoting Miller in his papers, he says that it's, um, it's extremely unlikely that any sort of index calculus attack um, will ever be able to work against elliptic curves. Now, there's certain instances because of technical reasons that that isn't true, but in general, he's, this, this quote remains correct to this day. Um, so basically, the day that they proposed elliptic curves um, to be used in cryptography, the very best attack that was known then is still the best attack that was known now, and it's generic. Um, 
essentially there's been no advances against the general elliptic curve discrete log problem. So while uh, RSA and finite field cryptography um, has suffered increasingly better attacks, elliptic curves have uh, stood the test of time and haven't, there's been no, no known attack that's, that's better than the generic um, attack that I'll talk about in a little while. Okay, so that, that quote remains true and it's why, we, um, it's why we're kind of obsessed as cryptographers, as practical cryptographers with elliptic curve groups. Um, because they're so strong against attackers that discrete log problem is so uh, hard. Okay, one um, one very oversimplified slide on how um, on how cryptography can work in the real world. This is one instance of how cryptography works. You might have heard of the TLS uh, protocol that's um, used in conjunction with a lot of things to protect the internet, to hopefully protect the internet. Um, but basically, when we talk about Diffie and Hellman or Alice and Bob, uh, when it applies to the internet, it's often um, best thought of it as, as if you're the client on your laptop and you're trying to connect to some server, whether it be your, uh, to, to do your internet banking or to connect to a secure web browser, uh, to, 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 to connect to a secure web session. Um, basically, TLS from a, from a cryptographer's point of view works like this. You do um, that public key crypto, so you do a mix of Diffie-Hellman and other stuff um, to arrive at that shared secret key. So that, that grey number that was down the bottom that Diffie and Hellman shared, that shared secret, they do some expensive public key operations to get to that point. Um, and then they use that as, an, as input to much faster symmetric ciphers. So you've heard about um, some of them already yesterday, uh, namely some hash functions, but that's, uh, well, that's one, one symmetric um, well, not even that. Let me, let me, well, you'll hear a lot more about block ciphers and um, stream ciphers, and they're the sorts of things that we're going to um, feed these secret keys into to do uh, encryption quickly on the fly. So the public key stuff is expensive. We, we, prefer, we prefer to just do that once at the start, and then all of the, all of the megabytes or um, gigabytes or kilobytes of traffic that we um, want to be encrypted after that, we do with uh, block ciphers or stream ciphers. So yeah, there's, there's basically two operations that we do in the public key, um, in the public key sense, at least in TLS. We do the Diffie-Hellman to, to get a shared secret, um, but we also want to know that I'm indeed talking, if I'm Diffie, I'm indeed talking to Hellman, and Hellman wants to know that he's indeed talking to Diffie, that there's no one playing in the middle or no one trying to impersonate each other. Um, and I want to know that, this, that, the, that the traffic I'm getting is, is from the person or, or from the the, the party that I think I'm getting it from. So that's, that's what we call authentication um, or digital signatures. So in the public key setting we do, we like to exchange, we like to arrive at a shared secret and we also like to know that we're talking to the right person um, via a digital signature. So most of the talk, in fact, uh, the rest of today's talk and all of my, uh, my second talk today and uh, my talk on Sunday will all be about the Diffie-Hellman component. Um, but you should know that there's there's another component that I'm sort of leaving out, which is digital signatures. A lot of a lot of the discussion that um, we'll look at today applies equally to digital signatures. Um, group exponentiations are needed there, but you need a little more. You need um, hash functions and so on. Um, it's just it's just simpler, I suppose, for this for this first talk to look at Diffie Hellman. Um, and I won't be talking about any of the symmetric key stuff. You'll hear about that in other talks and, and so on. Okay. So that's essentially how it works, and yes, as I said, ECC, elliptic curve cryptography, can be used to do both. So we can do elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, and we can do uh, ECDSA, elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, um, to do all of this, this initial public key stuff up the top. Okay. Uh, any questions before I jump to, jump to elliptic curves? No? Okay, good. So. Um, before I go any further, um, here's some good references uh, in, in case you're interested in more. The, the uh, Elliptic Curve Bible is, is the, the book by Silverman, um, and, and uh, there's also a more recent book on, on the mathematics of public key cryptography by um, Galbraith. They're both very good, very good texts if you're interested in this stuff. Um, but if you want a sort of more condensed view of the theory of elliptic curves, um, Silverman's talk is very, very good. The slides are public. Um, and Sutherland's MIT course on elliptic curves is more comprehensive, but it gives a quite a quite a good overview on all of the um, all of the theory 
three behind elliptic curves. This is kind of in the, for the most part independent of cryptography. Um, but if you want a, a, a read on the history of BCC and all of the sort of technical jargon that you might um, that you might want to, to, to get into with the curve cryptography, then um, this this survey paper from Koblitz and Menezes in two thousand and eight is very good as well. Okay, so um, here's our one page um, one page cheat sheet from uh, Algebra one hundred and one, um, just as a refresher, or maybe it's the first time you've seen these words before. Um, but this is, yeah, if you haven't seen any of these things before, then keep these things in mind when you hear words like group, ring, and field, what, what we're actually talking about. So we're talking about uh, all of these things are a set. It can be infinite or it can be finite. Um, but they're a set that's got an op at least one operation. So a group um, is a set that's got a, an operation, a binary operation. And by binary, I mean that you can take any two elements out of the set, any two elements out of the group, and perform an operation that gives you a third element in the group with some other properties. Um, but basically you can think of this, because uh, all the elements have uh, inverses with respect to this operation, you can think of being able to, to add and subtract inverses or add and add the uh, inverse of elements. So basically one operation that you can do in a group. In a ring we're allowed to do um, two operations. And again, the, the first operation has um, has an invert, has a, necessarily every element has an additive inverse. Um, and there's a second operation which we often write as, as multiply, um, but elements in a ring don't necessarily have uh, a multiplicative inverse. So um, one example is like the integers modulo 8, um, the element 4 doesn't have a multiplicative inverse. Um, so nothing times 4 is 1 modulo 8. Okay? Um, but then we come to a field where we've got this, this, um, this set where there's two binary operations and basically you can do inverse operations with respect to both. So you can uh, additively invert and multiplicatively invert. Now, these, I've written them as plus, minus, times and divide, but the whole point of abstract algebra is that these aren't the, um, necessarily the, plus, the pluses and multiplies that we use on our calculator. Um, they can be anything as long as these anything satisfy some certain properties. Okay, so we're, we're talking in abstract algebra land where um, these sets can be, can be anything we like as long as they're well defined with respect to some axioms. And these operations can also be anything as long as they satisfy the axioms as well. Um, okay, so if you've never seen an elliptic curve before, um, one, thing that, uh, one thing that I want you to keep in mind is, and, it, and it's, um, it might be a little hard to digest at first, but an elliptic curve is a group. So the elliptic curve is a group, it's a, it's a set with one operation, um, but it's defined over a field. So the key is that um, we write the elliptic curve group as E, and here's how we write its operation, and here's how I'll write its operation as O plus. Um, and so you can, do, you can do the O plus and the, the inverse of that operation, O minus, but because this elliptic curve is defined over a finite field, or over, not a finite field, just a, a general field K, um, the, the, the thing is that to do these two operations on the elliptic curve, you need to do a lot of... Uh,